Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In this uh, case, uh, a series that covers the period from October to December of 2013. It's a series about the sanctuary. Very interesting topic, a topic that has swirled around the Seventh-day Adventist Church for many years. This particular lesson is lesson number two for October 12 of 2013. And in, in, in we, we really would like you to get your Bible. You'll wish you had it because there's a lot of references here. And we would like to remind you also that if you choose to do so, uh, our handouts that we use in our discussion are available on the internet at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You'll also find there are audio recordings and uh, some video as well, if you care to look at that. Hope you not have your Bible in hand because we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Would you bow with us? Our Father, we realize that the sanctuary was an attempt on your part to come close to the human race, to dwell among us as it were. Help us now as we look at times when you did come close, you did attempt to dwell among us, and what the results were and what we can learn from those experiences. May we learn more about you in the process as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a very familiar passage found at the end of Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2. I'm going to read starting with Genesis 1, 31. God looked at everything he had made and he was very pleased. Evening passed and morning came. That was the sixth day. Reading on chapter 2, and so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day he had completed his creation and stopped working. Now you're going to say, hold on, this isn't a lesson about creation, this is a lesson about the sanctuary. Well, at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses was given a vision of the heavenly sanctuary and told to make a tent tabernacle here on this earth after that pattern, whatever that pattern was. There are many lessons to be learned from that sanctuary pattern and many parallels found elsewhere in Scripture. In this lesson, we will consider several of these. The first sanctuary created here on this earth was the Garden of Eden. You remember these verses, I hope, Exodus 25, uh, chapter eight, uh, verses 8 and 9. And I quote, The people must make a sacred tent for me so that I may live among them, make it in all its furnishings according to the plan that I will show you. Now wasn't that what God intended back when he made the Garden of Eden? It was a place to meet God. Wasn't, yeah, wasn't it supposed to be a place where God could come down and meet with Adam and Eve? To talk face to face. Yeah. To ask questions get answers. How come Abraham didn't need one of these? How come Jacob and Esau didn't need one of these? Well, why did, why did Adam and Eve need one? Well, because that was perfect there, but now when things are <laughs> imperfect, <laughs> why, why are we skipping from, from the Garden of Eden all the way over clear to Moses' time? Yeah. How come there wasn't one of these things in between? How come we just went with all these rock altars? Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to, to look at the Garden of Eden as a sanctuary. Where's the walls? Where's the cover? You have to have walls? Why do you need walls? Well, a sanctuary. You've got to have something to make it a sanctuary, don't you? It's a garden. It's a garden? Yeah. So a garden can be a sanctuary. It's a place to meet God, and that's what Exodus 25 says. And right? all the purpose gardeners of, know. Of the tent sanctuary in the wilderness. All gardeners know they meet God in the garden. When you're gardening, <laughs> you do. You. It's a, it's a sanctuary. Those of us that like it 
That's for sure. What? Say those of us that like it. Yes. Yes. Definitely yes. true. W what about it's not the always fun, It's not always a place to meet God when you're pulling up thistles. Oh yes, it is. God <laughs> pulled up the thistles in my life. Okay. Well, let's look at some parallels between <laughs> between the creation and the sanctuary. One, the words used to describe God's creation in the beginning are the same words used to describe his approval at the completion of the first earthly tabernacle. And if you look at the Hebrew words, the exact same words are used to describe it. And what, what were those words? What did they mean? I, I don't want to take the time to oh, do okay. that. If you look in the Sabbath school quarterly, it's all spelled out there. Okay. Um, two, just as God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis 3, 8, so the tabernacle and the later temples were intended as places for God to dwell among his people. We've already read those verses. Just pick another one. Look at 2 Samuel 7. This is Solomon's temple. From the time I rescued the people of Israel from Egypt until now, I have never lived in a temple. This is God speaking. I have traveled around living in a tent. And all my traveling with the people of Israel, I never asked any of the leaders that I appointed why they had not built me a temple made of cedar. So tell my servant David that I, the Lord Almighty, say to him, I took you from looking after sheep in the fields and made you the ruler of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have defeated all your enemies as you advanced. I will make you as famous as the greatest leader in the world. I have chosen a place for my people Israel and have settled there, them there where they will live without being oppressed or any more ever since they entered this land. They've been attacked by violent people and so forth. Anyway, he goes on to say that the tabernacle will be his home there in Jerusalem. Three, just as Adam and Eve were to tend and keep the garden, Genesis 2.15, the Levites were to care for the tabernacle sanctuary. Same words again. Tend and care for the garden, tend and care for the sanctuary. Numbers 3, 7 and 8. Four, the beautiful Garden of Eden with its flowers and trees form a pattern for the earthly sanctuary with its beautiful decorations of flowers and trees. Now, they didn't have beautiful flowers and trees growing out there in the desert, but if you looked inside the, on the curtains and so forth, inside the tabernacle, what was on the curtain? What was on the curtains? Pomegranates. Beautiful inwoven flowers and pomegranates and trees and so forth. So when you walked inside there and looked around, it's almost like you're in a beautiful garden. Five, cherubim guarded the garden. Remember when Adam and Eve were forced to go to leave? There were the cherubim guarding the garden. And what is on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place? Two cherubim. Six, the creation of our world was completed in six days. Each day stated that he was going to, God stated what he was going to do, followed by the seventh day Sabbath rest. In a similar pattern, there were six times when God spoke to Moses giving directions for the sanctuary, followed by a seventh section about the Sabbath. Now, you know, the, the ancient peoples were big into patterns, and maybe that's why it's like this. But just as creation, number seven, served as the original beginning of our world, the completion of the sanctuary was finished on the first day of the first month, this is of the second year, symbolizing the beginning of a new relationship with the children of Israel. Let me just read that to you, Exodus 40, verse 17. So on the first day of the first month of the second year after they left Egypt, the tent of the Lord's presence was set up. So just as he started with the Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden. Now after a year's preparation, they're starting their new nation with this new sanctuary at the foot of Mount Sinai. Is that, is, is there, is that an important, are those important parallels? Mm -hmm. Yes. All except it's confusing me now. Because mm -hmm. last week we were trying to make a point that there really was a sanctuary in heaven. Mm -hmm. Now we're comparing it to a garden, saying it's the same thing. So now I don't know what I'm looking for. Because in the garden, there's no building. Well, but, but the, in the garden, there was a tree of life. Well, that's true. That's true. But um, we were making a, a point last week that there really was a sanctuary. So what are we looking for? Okay. But now let's, let's be honest. 
It was not the trees and the shrubs and the flowers in the garden that made it special. What was special about that garden? God was there. Meeting God. God was there. Well, it's possible for God to meet anyone anywhere in the whole universe, yes. isn't it? Yes. Well, then, what's the purpose of having a sanctuary at some place? Okay, and, and that's precisely the question. God apparently has chosen to meet human beings at certain places at certain times, and we're trying to discover why he does that. Without dom dominating their all their time, so he gives them, gives them space and time to be alone, away from, uh, out of the presence of God. Now, before there was sin in the Garden of Eden, was there a sanctuary in heaven that had candlesticks and showbread, or did that part of the sanctuary come about when Eve and Adam sinned? Okay, I don't believe there were candlesticks. The, the term candlestick is something from the Middle Ages, and it was translated by the King James because they didn't understand that what was really on that lampstand was little oil lamps uh, made from, that made to burn olive oil. The, the sanctuary changed as sin came into the world. The Garden of Eden didn't need all those implements, no. nor an uh, altar of sacrifice, but after sin, it seems like those items appeared mm -hmm. in the sanctuary. So, let, yeah. Of course, remember that sin didn't start in Eden. Sin <laughs> started right. in heaven, started in, in the, the sanctuary, sanctuary, in the heavenly right. sanctuary, if we can think of it yeah, so that there way, was. in the number one angel. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay, so Gary is pushing me to do something <laughs> which I need to do sooner or later, so let's do it now. What is a sanctuary? Maybe we should define that, yes. Yes. What is a sanctuary? What were sanctuary cities? There were. There were. So um, th there might be some clue in that direction. Yeah. But let's take just a basic word. What does sanctuary mean? Sacred. It means a holy place. What makes any place holy? The presence of God. The presence of God. So if God says, I choose to meet you right here, then what does this become? Holy ground. A sanctuary. Well, but in the English language, yeah, we use saying. sanctuary for us something other than, yeah, than holy. Ways. You know, in a rainstorm, you can take sanctuary in a porch. Yeah, we, and we've expanded the meanings of this word, but in the original, sanct comes from, is the same word from which we derive saint, from which we derive holy. The Greek word hagios, we get our word holy. It, it's, it's a holy place. That's what, that's what the word sanctuary means. It also, it's come to mean also a safe place, and that's what you're talking about. Maybe safe from the rain. It might be safe from, Gary's talking about sanctuaries that you could run to if you accidentally killed somebody to be, to be protected from his, his relatives that might want to do you in. City, city of refuge. Yeah, these, these yeah. So the, the word has gotten, ex it, its meanings have expanded over the years, but the original meaning, it's a holy place, and what made it holy was the presence of God. Well, then there's got to be a sanctuary in heaven if you're going to meet God somewhere. Sure. And that's probably the whole point right there, isn't it? Well, but now, okay, so <laughs> now let's take the next step. But God is everywhere. But God is everywhere. However, apparently, God has a place in heaven. And it has a certain, apparently it has some kind of walls maybe, and it has certain furniture in it, because he told Moses to make the earthly one after the pattern he saw in heaven. Well, maybe, uh, maybe the sanctuary is real big and we're all right in it right now. Well, where's the table of showbread? Anytime where's we talk about places or being someplace or whatever, you're talking in finite terms. And here we're trying to look into the will of the infinite one, <laughs> which, you know, is finite. <laughs> our language and our concepts just yeah. don't accommodate yeah. no, but it. We, we don't know what we're going to look like even. Yeah. How can we speculate on what the sanctuary is? Well, we were made in the image of God. That's right. <laughs> 
What does that mean? That's, that's a good what standard. Let's see. <laughs> How can I check oh up on God. that? <laughs> well, <laughs> in the original language, mm -hmm. uh, that the um, uh, the beginning of the Bible was written. Mm -hmm. Does sanctuary mean holy place? Yes. The word that is used. Yes. Does it have any other meaning? It just means a holy place. Um. What language would that be that it was first Hebrew. written in? Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew. Hebrew. Okay. So yeah. the word means holy place. Yeah. Oh. Okay. You've got a place now. Remember, now, l let me be honest for, for, the, for the scholars who might be listening. Sanctuary <laughs> is actually a Latin word, not even Greek or Hebrew. So we're now three languages or so many languages. That's why I was asking yeah. about the original word yeah. still meant holy place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but if we got a holy place now, we have Moses putting together a place for God. Mm -hmm. He's got all the symbols coming into it now. Yes. Mm -hmm. What are the symbols? Are the symbols about God? Maybe it's maybe he's God is telling us of history, too. Okay. And maybe history in in the far past. So so here's and you're 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 headed in the right direction. The point is. There's a lot of sanctuary stuff in the Old Testament. Are those symbols, are, is that building supposed to teach us something? Or is it just, oh, well, there's another building? Well, in Hebrews, there's a lot of sanctuary stuff in the New Testament, too. Yeah, and, and it, without that, we would know very little bit about the sanctuary in the Old Testament. So we really need the book of Hebrews, and we'll lean on it pretty heavily. Question. Let, let me do that right now for just a section. So I'm going to suggest two things. One, there is a real sanctuary in heaven. We're going to read about that a little bit later. And two, it's not all of heaven. It's a place in heaven. And I base that on these verses, Hebrews 8, verse 2. He serves as high priest in the most holy place, that is, in the real tent, which is put up by the Lord, not by human hands. That sounds like a real place, doesn't it? Sure does. Well, I've never seen a place like that. No, I'm not asking if you've seen it. I'm asking, God says, God says it's there. Verse 5, same chapter. The work they do as priests is really only a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. It is the same as it was with Moses. When he was about to build the sacred tent, God said to him, Be sure to make everything according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. Sounds like he saw a real pattern of something and he made a real copy. And in then one, one more verse, one more okay. verse. This is Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ has already come as the high priest of the good things that are already here. The tent in which he serves is greater and more perfect. It is not a tent made by human hands. That is, it is not a part of this created world. So there is a tent not made by human hands, or, or at least a, a building, a, he calls it a tent, some kind of something up there in heaven. Well, um, John in Revelation 21-22 says, I did not see a temple in the city. We're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> well, just want to contrast. <laughs> and, and, and also Moses... Trying to put it together. <laughs> in, in, the instructions that were, were left for Moses weren't just go out and create this thing that you saw. No. When you look in, in Leviticus and other places, Exodus and so on, yeah. there's pretty specific things. How a many lot posts of, and how detail. tall they are. A lot of detail. How the thing is supposed to go together and how it's supposed to be carried. Exactly. And when it's so it's quite specific, uh, at least. I could point. read you chapters about the details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Are we saying that in Eden, in the Garden of Eden, there were no parameters? Then how then was the cherubim able to guard the garden? No, there were per, there, there were had to be. Yes, there there was there was there, a was, of some there kind. was a border of some kind around the Garden of Eden. There had to there be. There had to be. Yeah. So okay. Possibly even an entrance. Explain there had to be one. There. Just one open. At least a place where you can't go. You you couldn't go back in. Hmm. Okay. Well, when talking about the sanctuary in Scripture. Now let's talk about some of the functions, maybe. There is a great deal of typology. Oh boy, another big word. What is typology? Symbols. Does that mean examples? Well, let's think about this. Let, let, let's think about typology for a moment. 
we have on this campus here at Loma Linda University some beautiful sculptures. And they're made of brass, I guess, or bronze or something like that. Um, were they made just like that? Did he start with a big chunk of matte brass and start carving it? H how do sculptors work these days? Well, they made molds. Okay, well think about that. So this is typology. What they do is they start out with something that's relatively soft, relatively easy to work, and they make what uh, they, and maybe they do it several times until they get it the way they want it. Then what do they do? They cover it with special material, usually some kind of liquid stuff, and they cover it and cover it until they make a solid, and that thing dries hard, and then they, they separate it somehow or other and empty out all that stuff that they work so hard producing, and then they take the metal or whatever they're going to make it out of and pour it into that mold, and then they carefully take the mold off, and what do they have? A copy. They have a, an, presumably, if they've done it right, they've had a, they have a perfect copy of what they originally made, right? A cast. A cast of the original thing that they made. So now let's think about that. How does that, what, when we talk about typology, Moses, the, the, the tabernacle, that Moses here had here on this earth was a which one of those three steps? The perfect the perfect final thing would be the thing in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Presumably what we have here on this earth would be Archetype. maybe <laughs> the statue Not exactly. it's uh. it's had its cast removed in the statue, is that what you mean? Something like that, yeah. Shadow. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's made after that. In other words, God has shrunk down his, his, his cast or whatever you call it, and presumably here's a, here's a tabernacle that's made in the mold of the heavenly. Well, it's kind of a representation of the shape. Yeah. Of the pattern. So, the pattern is used. We're talking about the casting process here, mm -hmm. and the pattern is used. Yeah, to you're make, the expert. Tell uh, us about it's it. It's used to make the mold, uh -huh. and then. You remove the pattern right. one way or another, and that right. leaves a, a cavity that's the shape of the pattern, right. and then you fill that with you know, and then what we're talking with bronze or something. So like in, in typology here, let's say we're suggesting that here was this big mold, and God has a temple in heaven, so now he's going to make a mold out of that, and now he's going to, because we can't do it in, with, in a temple not made with hands, he shrinks it down, he says, okay, now here's a smaller mold, I want you to make one like this, here on this earth. And that's a, I mean, that, 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 that's a poor example, but I, I'm trying to help us to understand it. When Hebrews says that uh, God showed Moses a pattern, might it have just been like a drawings or a symbol, uh, a, a replica of what he wanted, not a replica of what was in heaven? Well, that's a possibility until you go to Book of the Hebrews and where it talks about Jesus specifically entering the temple not made with hands and talks about the different parts that are there in the temple that Jesus entered not made with hands. What do we do with those verses? In Revelation 21. We'll, we'll get to that. Don't, don't. <laughs> Just be a little bit patient. Well, a second sanctuary or temple that the Bible speaks about was Jesus himself. You remember what, John, what he said in John 2, 19 to 20? Two twenty-one. And Jesus answered, "Tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it again." Are you going to build it again in three days? They asked him. It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, but the temple Jesus was speaking about was his body. body. Okay. So is that another sanctuary? Yes. If you look at John one fourteen, a few verses earlier. It says, the Word became a human being and full of grace and truth lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. We have suggested that a sanctuary is a holy place because God is living among us. If Jesus is here in person, is God living among us? Yes. So what should we learn from that? and I'm using quotation marks now, 
that temple. By the way, the Greek for uh, to dwell is skenao. And when it talks about uh, the, the tent, which Jesus is talking about there, it's skinny from that same word. And Jesus had all the elements of the temple in him. He was the light of the world, the candlesticks. He was the bread of life, the showbread. He was the lamb sacrificed. Um, come to him and you're washed. Um, mm -hmm. He's now the day of atonement mm -hmm. and he's going to come as the judge. How about the scapegoat? Is he part of that? No. But but now let's, 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 let, you know, fair, that's a fair question, that, but let's. That let's, was a process in the temple. I was speaking of the actual implements in the temple. But let, let, let's, did Jesus believe that his body equated in one way or another to the tabernacle, even Herod's temple? Yes. How, how where would you document that in the Bible? Well, that's when he says, um, I'm the light of the world. I'm the. Okay, but he didn't. He never called the Herod's temple the light of the world. No. Well, it, but it had the candlesticks in it. So, what is your question? My question is, do we have evidence from the scriptures itself that Jesus was saying, "Tear down this temple, my body," and basically, you bring the sanctuary services in the temple on Mount Moriah to an end. In other words, when my body ends, that ends. Didn't he say? one greater than the temple, or this I have year. left your house yes. desolate. Okay, that's, that's a hint, but there's an even better one. Look at Matthew 27, 51. Okay. We've already looked at the John one. Look at Matthew 27, 51. I should look at the cheat sheet. <laughs> yeah, you should. The, we have it in front of us. What happened the moment Jesus died? Curtain. Then the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and that was, what, 30 or 40 feet up there. And it, this huge, enormous tent, remember, we're talking about the middle of the, of the Passover weekend, where there's hundreds of thousands, maybe, of people watching, and here they're watching, and this, t this huge, heavy curtain just goes rip from top to bottom. What is Jesus trying to tell us? When he dies, the sanctuary system, as they have known it for, what, 1,500 years? What was this curtain doing? Didn't that separate the holy from the most holy place? Yes. So once that curtain was ripped open, well, you could, you could see in there. Does that indicate access is av yes. available there? But the people didn't see into the holy place, did they? Well, they could, they could there, there, were, there were pillars and the curtains were sometimes open from the outside. So if you were in the right position, you could look into the holy place, and if the curtains ripped open, you could look into the most holy place. You could look at that from the Mount of Olives. Uh, in fact, you could look at, you could look for, even from the Mount of Olives across if you were in the right spot and look right into the temple. We're, we're talking about well, now I'm not sure of that because the wall may have been high enough to prevent that, but, but theoretically you could. You're talking we're ta about we're ta the holy place. You the holy place, but now that the t now that that curtain is ripped open, you could see straight into the mo most holy. Place. And what was in the most holy place? More than anything. Nothing but a rock. Is that what they put in there? Nothing but a rock, because the ark of the covenant was where, gone. Where did you hear about? The, where where did you get that? Is that tradition? That's tradition, but it's also in the writings of Ellen White. Oh. You know, there are three times that the hand of God <coughs> has entered the world, with the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments in the palace before Babylon fell, wrote on the wall, mm -hmm. and reached up and ripped the curtain when Christ died. Yeah. So we have had hands of God reach into our world. It's a pretty scary thing, isn't it? <laughs> so, so how are you interpreting this? You can interpret it as God taking the sanctuary and ripping it apart, or you can take it as Him ripping the thing apart and revealing that there's nothing in there. Or you could take it as ripping it apart, now we have access to it. Yeah, and I'm taking it to mean when Jesus died, all of this symbolism that he's been looking at for all these years has now come to an end. Well, he became 
the symbol. Because, yeah, because you Jesus, became. because the living lamb the living has died. The, the real lamb has died. He has done what needed to be done. There's no longer necessary to be sacrificing any more lambs or coming to that temple for that and matter. And he is the holy place and mm -hmm. the inside holy place. And the, and the purpose of the, of the sanctuary, that sanctuary, was to point forward mm -hmm. to this emergence of the Messiah. And the Messiah is here, so now you don't need it anymore. So we say that the coming of Jesus to this earth was specifically to teach us about God. Now let's, let's, if we say now that Jesus is a temple and he's compared to the temple, these temples we've been talking about, the sanctuaries, what do we learn from the sanctuaries about God? Mm. Sin. No. sin. More than we can understand. Sin has consequences. Mm -hmm. And that God himself will deal with the consequences. Okay. There may be some code in the thing as far as um, giving us some f information about why sin started in the first place. Some people think that what happened there has a lot to do with God's wrath. What happens where? In the sanctuary? Well, at the death of Jesus. And then when they turn to the sanctuary, God says, okay, that's it. I've had it. Well, if, if the wrath is him leaving, ripping the, the curtain, finding out there's nothing in there, might mm -hmm. be kind of an indicator that way. Do we have any hints of that anywhere else in the Bible? Of what? The God leaving the temple? Uh, leaving it? Leaving the temple. Well, uh, the, there was a time when the Shekinah departed. When was that? that? Where was that? Old Testament someplace. Um, yeah, well, that, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes okay, no, I forget. The, exactly last, the last ten chapters, if I'm not mistaken, of the book Ezekiel. And it's specifically, it says, because you're not doing what I told you to do, and it shows the Shekinah glory of God, step by step, leaving the sanctuary, going to the edge of the city, going to the mountain, and departing. And then, of course, Jerusalem was conquered. Didn't, didn't anybody say, come back, come back? Mm. Is that how God leaves us, little by little? And if we don't say, come back, he's gone? Yeah. And then we're on our own? Well, we don't have a lot of time. We, we've looked yeah. at those. Let's look at some more examples. What do we do with 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17? Surely you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you yourselves are his temple. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read another verse. But if you look at the context here, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church as a church. The Corinthian church, you are God's temple. Well, does he make it a little more personal? Is, it, is he talking about the individual? Okay, or is you want to talk church? about the more personal? Go to chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself but to God. He bought you for a price, so use your bodies for God's glory. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit being inside us and us drinking a jug of alcohol and, and, <laughs> and you know, I mean, think of what the Holy Spirit puts up with when he tries to clean up his people. So is there a part of me that is uh, a light to the world? Is there a part of me that is the bread, is of, life? bread of life? Is there a part of me that it can... Says uh, Intercede with prayers. You've got to be careful or you're going to end up painting yourself in the corner you're thinking you're God or something. But No, but we are supposed to be like God, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Image. Mm -hmm. like so God. doesn't this suggest that the church, and not only the church, but we as individuals are supposed to be temples of God? I mean, let me give you a couple more verses. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.6. 6. How can God's temple come to terms with pagan idols? 
for we are the temple of the living God, as God himself has said, I will make my home with my people and live among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. First Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians 6, verse 16. And one more verse, look at Ephesians 2, starting with 19. So then you Gentiles, now you might have been, you know, some of us might have think, well, so far he's just been talking to Jews. Now he's talking to all of us. You Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone. What's he talking about here? Is this a building? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. So this temple built up now, it consists of Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, apostles and prophets as foundation. We're supposed to be the bricks that build the walls, right? He is the one, Christ, who holds the whole building together and who makes it grow into a sacred temple dedicated to the Lord. And you knew with him, you too, you Gentiles, that means me and all of you, are being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. Isn't that a sanctuary? If God lives there through his yes. spirit. But every time we speak of temple, uh, like our body is as temple, we talk about if we drank or fornic fornication and what have you. But doesn't Jesus, didn't Jesus himself say it's what comes out of your mouth, your thought process, mm -hmm. and those things solve you as well. So mm -hmm. we have to think, kind of think of the whole, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, what about that? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we have two more examples of temples that are supposed to be dwelling places for God. The Christian church and the Christian's body. Aren't we supposed to be a holy priesthood? Yes. You know those verses. First Peter 2, uh, verse 5, Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple. We just read about that in Ephesians 2. Um, where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. We're not just supposed to be stones. We're supposed to be what? Priests. Priests. Define priests. We're not talking about priests like in the Catholic Church. What kind of priests are we talking about? Well, let's, we're, we're presumably talking about priests more like the priests in the Old Testament. And what did they do? <coughs> that me, they a lot of things. They met people at the tent of the at the door of the t of the opening and brought them in. They carried out the ceremonial uh, uh, various ceremonies. They offered lambs. They offered them, put them on the halter of burnt offering. They, they went through the purification ceremonies. They did all the things. Did they, they teach? They, they sang and they taught. They taught? Mm -hmm. So when we're priests, we are to be welcoming teachers of mm -hmm. the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. and the elements thereof? I think when we're priests, we're reflecting the image of God. That's what the that's work what is supposed happen. to be. Yeah. And that's, even in the, that time, he w the priest was kind of the representative of God mm -hmm. to people who were watching. Christians have often suggested that we are saved by being covered by Christ's righteousness. Okay, you've, I'm sure you've heard that term. How was that represented in the sanctuary services? If we are to become true temples or sanctuaries for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, how does that impact our behavior? Or does Christ's righteousness just cover over our sinful lives? And Jesus sneaks us into heaven covered over with his righteousness so God doesn't know what kind of people we really are. We're looking for a connection between those two? I'm asking. Well, well, is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Are we covered by Christ's righteousness or is Christ's righteousness supposed to be inside us and like just 
oozing from us. I mean, is this something that yeah. we hide ourselves or are we supposed to absorb Christ's righteousness? Jesus talked about people who looked nice on the outside and were full of dead man's bones inside, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it covered almost, almost sounds like something that you want, mm -hmm. maybe that you're, you aren't exactly what, what it is, but it's something that you want and you wear it as if mm -hmm. well I'm wondering about something. the original word covered if it means just a, an external cover with nothing affecting the inside um, you know, that might be research what does the word covered mean well I'm sure that to the original Hebrews and the people the people who understood Hebrew in the Old Testament a cover would remind them of the lid on the sanctuary because even today their most holy day in the Jewish year is called the Yom Kippur, the day of the cover. Of the cover, okay. And the cover was the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. So God's mercy meets in us, Jesus mm -hmm. and the sinful us. Interesting, so the day of the covering, the mercy mm -hmm. seat. Yeah. Revelation 7, 7 has some interesting ideas. Look at verses 15 to 17. That is why they stand before God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. Aren't we supposed to be priests? He who sits on the throne will protect them with his presence. Never again will they hunger or thirst, neither sun nor any scorching heat will burn them because the lamb who is in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of life-giving water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. How's that for a presence in the temple? Now we need to come to Gordon's question that he's been raising. Look at Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. Now, just straw vote, I want to ask you to even raise your hands. Think about it. Would you say the New Jerusalem is equivalent to the heavenly sanctuary? While you're thinking about it, let me read on. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be uh, their God, does that sound like God's dwelling place? He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, and now I make all things new. He also said to me, write this because these words are true and can be trusted. And he said, it is done. I am the first and the last and the beginning and the end. To anyone who is thirsty, I will give the right to drink from the spring of the water of life without paying for it. Those who win the victory will receive this from me. I will be their God and they will be my children. But cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars, the place for them is the lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, who's the bride? The church. God's holy people. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to the top of a very high mountain. Is that inside the city, outside the city? Outside. He showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, are now looking from the top of the mountain. Presumably, they're looking away down at the holy city, right? Coming down out of heaven from God and shining with the glory of God. The city shone like a precious stone, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels in charge of the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of the people of Israel. There were three gates on each side, three in the east, three on the south, three in the north, three on the west. The city's wall was built on 12 foundation stones on which were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. What would you think about having your name written on one of the foundations of the holy city of God? Wow. Mm -hmm. 
The angel who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The, angel, the city was perfectly square, as wide as it was long. The angel measured the city with his measuring rod. It was 2,400 kilometers, which is about 1,500 miles long and was as wide and as high as it was long. Now we've got a perfect cube. Does that remind you of anything? Mm -hmm. What? Oh, I know, but I, it, the measurement given. Okay. What does it remind you of? The, whole, the most holy place in every one of those sanctuaries was a perfect cube. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So this new Jerusalem could be the new sanctuary after mm -hmm. sin has been purged or just before it's going to be purged. Okay, so we read on. Um, the angel also measured the wall. It was 60 meters high according to the standard unit of measure which he was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city itself was made of pure gold as clear as glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. By the way, does God like beautiful stones? And so do I. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a rock hound. He's a rock hound. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx. I'm sure that this is going to be one gorgeous, gorgeous place. The sixth carnelian, the seventh yellow quartz, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chalcedony, the eleventh turquoise, the twelfth amethyst. And amethyst is beautiful. Well, all of them. Let me not make any choices. The twelve gates were, were twelve pearls. I mean, there's going to be some super frustrated oysters, right? <laughs> <laughs> Each gate was made from a single pearl. Imagine. You know, you, you can almost look, a real pearl, a real high quality pearl, you can almost like look into it, you know. The street of the city was of pure gold, transparent as glass. I did not see a temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Uh-oh. Yeah, what does, oh, yeah. What happened there? Yeah. Hmm, Gordon? I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and I will take you to a very interesting passage. As many of you know, shortly after the 1844 disappointment, a young woman by the name of Ellen Harmon had a vision. And at first she told just her friends, and they were so excited about it, they wanted to tell everybody, and she said, no, this is, this is not to be told to everybody. I don't want it to be spread all around. But finally they convinced her to write it out. And it, even when it was written out, she said, this is not for general circulation. But later she said, well, yeah, I guess more people need to hear about it. And so this is what she says. And I have just uh, condensed it here a little bit. Then, and, and she's talking about being taken by Jesus with a group of people to heaven. And she talks about walking through the city and all the beautiful things they saw in the city. And finally, then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city. Mount Zion was just before us. You think that has anything to do with the high mountain which we read about in Revelation 21? Remember the high mountain? Mm -hmm. Mount Zion was just before us and on the mount sat a glorious temple. And where is this temple? On Mount Zion. And where's Mount Zion? Jerusalem. Huh? It's Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You didn't hear what I just read you. Then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city. Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount sat a glorious temple. And about it were seven other mountains on which grew roses and lilies. And I saw the little ones climb where they chose, use their little wings and fly to the top of the mountains and pluck the never fading flowers. There were all kinds of trees around the temple to beautify the place. And as we, and I've left out parts of this, so it, I would really encourage you all to go back and read the whole story. Um, as we were about to enter the holy temple on Mount Zion outside the city, Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, only the 144,000 enter this place. And we shouted, hallelujah. 
This temple was supported by seven pillars, all of transparent gold, set with pearls most glorious. The glorious things I saw there I cannot begin to, uh, to describe. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan, then could I tell a little of the glory of the upper world. But a faithful you soon will know all about it. I saw there the tables of stone on which the names of the 144,000 were engraved and letters of gold. After we had beheld the glory of the temple, we went out. Then Jesus left us and went to the city. Where is the temple according to that vision? Outside the city on the mount. Above. On the top of Mount Zion, right? Well, it says. So, Gordon? Well, he still said he didn't see the temple. In the city. In the city. Well, I didn't say that. He yeah, just said in read the it, city. It, it says Revelation in the city. Revelation 22. I did not see a temple in the city uh -huh. because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Yeah, but it sounds to me like instead of a temple, now we got the Lord and the Lamb. So, and why wouldn't he, if the temple was on Mount Zion, how come he didn't see it? Because that was inside the city. So he didn't look outside the city, even though he saw... The mountain up the, there. He, well, he saw the Lord up above the mount of the city. Well, that's, that's, a, that's, a separate, that's a different vision. Oh, well, it's still looking at the same place, isn't okay. it? Okay, well, we want... <laughs> okay, I'm going to let you think about Can that. You okay, I'll that just have to think. From? Did you tell us? Yes, that's the very first vision Ellen White s uh, saw. It's entitled... It was, when it was written out, it was written in a little paper called The Day Star. It was her vision of December 20 of 1845. Mm -hmm. And so this is how God kicked off her faith in what she was doing and that he just and it's quite a bit longer it, it's, it's great you need to read the whole thing but we're not done I have some more things to talk okay. about many Christians talk about heaven in various ethereal terms they almost and you know the pictures are what the pictures of someone float, playing a harp and floating on a cloud right many Christians talk about heaven in various ethereal terms they almost spiritualize away the truths of scripture about heaven and I have this quotation. This is from The Great Controversy, page 674 and 675. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. What does that sentence mean? Mm. There is a material fulfillment of all the prophecies. That's what John, I get. John 14, when it says, Jesus says, Jesus says to us, I'm going and I'm making places for you to live. Those are real places. Okay? And we're supposed to, and there are, what I just read to you from Ellen White, there are real flowers and there are real trees and there are real mountains and there's a real city. This is a real place. Okay? Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them in the Father's house. And the word mansion, by the way, there is not talking about some millionaire's home. This is talking about rooms, places to dwell, but they will be better than any mansion on this earth in any, in any case. Those who accept the teachings of God's word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly abode. And yet I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And what were Ellen White's words? Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan. Then could I tell a little of the glory of the upper world. But a faithful you soon will know all about it. Same idea, right? Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. Great Controversy 674 and 675. So now we've talked about the Garden of Eden as a sanctuary. We've talked about the body of 
the life and death of Jesus as being a sanctuary. We've talked about, the, of course, the, the three sanctuaries from, from the Old Testament. We've talked about the church. the church as a sanctuary. We've talked about our bodies as sanctuaries. Which one of those sanctuaries is most appealing to you? Jesus. Most appealing with regard to what? But each what, of them tells us something. Okay, and that, that's the important point. We're supposed to learn something from each one of those sanctuaries, right? What we're, what we're trying to say here is, let's think outside the box. Let's not just say sanctuary. Oh, that was a tent that Moses made at the foot of Mount Sinai. The Bible has sanctuary pictures all through it. Big, broad, wide, even us. We are supposed to be sanctuaries. So... The Garden of Eden as the original sanctuary, the tent at the foot of Mount Sinai, Solomon's temple, probably the most beautiful building ever built on this earth, Herod's temple in which Jesus himself sat and taught, or the Christian church, which is supposed to be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or even us ourselves. In this lesson, we have seen that God has repeatedly, in different ways, tried to suggest to us that he wants to dwell as closely to us as he possibly can. Obviously, at this point in time, if he appeared in all his glory, we would be consumed. We know what he said to Moses. Thus, he makes available to us his Holy Spirit. How ungrateful of us it would be to refuse such a gift. In what sense did God dwell bodily in the presence of Jesus Christ? when he was here on this earth? Would it be correct to say that everything that Jesus did had been planned carefully and intentionally between himself, the Holy Spirit, and the Father? How closely does his church here on this world follow that pattern? How well do we do in following that pattern? Is everything we do every day done according to God's will? In later lessons, we will discuss in more detail why Seventh-day Adventists believe that the sanctuary system formed a pattern to give us the interpretation of Daniel 8, 14 and 9, 24 to 27. Are you comfortable with what you now know about our church history and their relationship to 1844? I'm more comfortable with it than a lot of Adventists. Yeah. Well, we have seen many symbols and we could go on. Jesus is compared in the New Testament to many parts of the heavenly sanctuary. And there's many more things to come. We hope you'll be with us each time as we discuss more. See you next time.